I had a friend, and this is going back about 30 years now. Uh, and I mention that because how weird that it sticks in my mind. Um, this was when she was breaking up with her long-term boyfriend. They'd been living together for several years. Uh, and obviously, like you would, they were discussing, well, what went wrong? What did I do wrong? He said. And what she said was, well, you always leave the toilet seat up, don't you? And that, why does that sit with me so many years later? And of course, that's not the entire truth. She was seeing another guy. Um, but why pick on that? And it just struck me as kind of brilliant example of where we just kind of hit one of the walls of our minds. And I want to make that kind of image, the walls of our minds, um, because it's quite good because when you walk into a wall, it hurts. You bounce off or you stare in shock or, you know, sometimes there's blood. It's, uh, it's painful, you notice. We can talk about the walls of our minds, the walls of ourselves. I think that's quite an interesting way of putting it. Boundaries of the self. And the walls of our minds, not in the sense that, oh yes, this is an experience we all share. I mean, obviously we do. But that's not why I'm saying that, because I want to point out that this is not a wall round my mind, but a, a wall between us, a wall that's always there, potentially, in relationship. And sometimes the specifics of that relationship mean there's a wall between us. Yeah. I'll take another example. Um, Barry Majid, my teacher, talks about when he was a new father. Somewhat later in life. He's very well respected, very professional New York psychoanalyst. What could be cooler than that? And then suddenly he's confronted with this child and his apartment is suddenly just a mess. It's strewn with baby stuff and noise. And then, of course, there are toys everywhere and you fall over them and just kind of, ah, oh, you know, what a kind of physical shock he found that. He's perfectly honest about it, you know. This was not who he was. And suddenly this was who he was. Uh, what do I do about that? It wasn't easy. Maybe I experienced something not entirely dissimilar from that myself. But that's walking into a wall. A wall of my mind, his mind, a wall of ourselves in that sense. Last example for now. Uh, and again, this is going back a long way. This is when I was a uh, pre-teen. So that's kind of like very early 1970s. And that time, my mum still used to cut my hair. Um, and this was the beginning of the 1970s. And, um, well, face it. Long hair was cool, and if you didn't have long hair, then you were just, forget it. So naturally, I wanted long hair. And of course, at that time, being that age, long hair is still something which just covers the ear. Maybe just touches your shirt collar, yeah. What? The reason I mention this is because, yeah, my mum used to cut my hair. And she said, 
Oh, Malcolm, you don't know what this does to me. Because she hated, she wanted me to have proper hair. Hair like it should be. Proper boy hair. You don't know what this does to me. And, you know, clearly that was a wall for her and it was a wall for me too. Like, you know, it's kind of, get off, Mum. You know, what, where are you making so much fuss? What's this about, surely? <gasps> and in all these examples, I mean, there's really no right, no wrong. But there's relationship and there's some kind of wall. And that was definitely, you know, and I had a pretty good relationship with my mum on the whole. Wonderful woman. But this particular, oh no. <sighs> yeah. So we can talk about these kind of things as, you know, abstract intellectual understandings. But as we experience just hitting these walls, you know, they, they hurt. They're painful, they disrupt, they rupture. And this is an experience that we all share. We feel them. We feel them deeply and we feel them personally. And quite often we feel them physically as well. You know, that sort of, of shock. I feel it in my chest or does it make me feel queasy in my stomach or is it a knot in my... It's, it's all there, it's this connection of physical feeling with emotion. What do I do then? Well, of course, I, I, I justify. I'm the one in the right here. Of course, it's utterly ridiculous that. How could they? Ugh. Nobody understands me, clearly. I'm not met. I'm not matter. I'm not recognized by this other. relationship stumbles and hopefully we work around it hopefully we get over it hopefully it renews and transforms but it's certainly relationship that's what's in question here now, I wanted to point to these examples because What we're doing is we're developing some kind of awareness of our reactions, our responses. And we're beginning to feel out where our sore points are. Where are we reactive? And where are we responsive? And what kind of things are these about? And what do they begin to connect up with? If we begin to understand them, two things. They begin to lose that immediate reactive power over us. We gain some kind of freedom, some kind of choice. And... We understand, we begin to widen our understanding of what it is to be this self in this moment. Because if I put down that idea that I am a, th I am a thing, I am one thing, I always have been and still am and always will be this thing, and I have one mind and around me is a world from which I'm completely separate, and from within this mind I go out to the world. That's really what we're trying to question all the time. How is it that this complex, infinite complex of relationships turns up here, now, as this person, this thing, this reaction to this situation? Yeah. So it's when I talk about the walls of the self, the walls of my mind, am I thinking about a curtain wall that goes right round and an inside and an outside? And there are forces coming from the outside and acting on me, which I have to resist. 
Oh. Am I thinking of an infinite complexity of relationships? And from time to time we find specifics of war which maybe dissolve and maybe don't. And going back to some of the other images we've been playing, Choco Beck's images of ice, hard, crystalline, but also fragile, shatters, and the softening of that. So we can begin to, am I a hard self? Am I a soft, fluid self? Can I, do I see my own ability to move and adjust? compensate within a situation? Do I see the way which I emerge out of that situation? We can get the idea that the idea behind Zen and Buddhism is to take it all on me, I'm responsible for anything, I should be able to be in control of this. And well, frankly, no. And as I say, most of these situations, there's no right no wrong in, there's just relationship and relationship, finding a block, finding a stumble. And the sin of judgment. And I mention these kind of things because they are, as we say, most intimate. They're kind of where I'm most made of my most made aware of myself as a a different thing, I'm different from you, I'm separate from you, because you're on my back, or you always leave the toilet seat up, or there's this stuff, or whatever. And these are very intimate situations, but they're also social, and they're social relationships. And I mean, we can just, let's just go through them again, just tease out some of the the wide, wide range that we, we can't help but, but think about. My friend getting angry about the toilet seat. I mean, yeah, bathroom, toilet, it's a very intimate place. We feel quite vulnerable within there. It's obviously very important how we feel about the person that we're actually sharing that space with. And it's funny, isn't it, in a heavily gendered world, that leaving the toilet seat up or putting the toilet seat down has a value. Um, yeah, my father, my dad, um, some of his moments when he felt that uh, my masculinity was perhaps less visible than it might be, he used to say, Oh, you'll be sitting down to piss next. Um, yeah. And so, well, okay, so leaving the seat up obviously is a, an assertion of my masculinity. Um, and we know, I mean, you can take it from there really, can't you? So I was reading the other day and I found out actually in Germany this is not so at home, in their own space. <laughs> Most German men will sit down. Oh, little shock there. So this is cultural as well as gendered. Yeah. And, I don't know, is there a, a class component there as well? Well, I don't know, but, you know, in this case, the other guy um, happened to be the head of department in the university where this friend was teaching at and uh, he was tall and independently wealthy and you know enough said perhaps but so it's, it's a complex situation but how to actually show up what can we actually point to little wall little block you leave the toilet seat up and we'll think about my my mum and the hair thing, you know, and I go, this is, this is the 19, very early 1970s, just gone to senior school, and, you know, the school has put out a, a very definite letter to parents, remember, hair must not be allowed to either touch the ear or the collar, your child may be sent home, 
So this is the 1970s then, it's the, uh, it's the beginnings of feminism, it's the beginning of gender questioning, gender bending, as it was sometimes referred to then. And yeah, if you'd ask my kind of 12-year-old self, you know, kind of 50 years later, would every girl want to dress up as a princess and have a fairy tale wedding while all the men there wore tuxedos, I would have gone, are you joking? But no, some things change. We move in one direction, we move back. It's, it's complicated. But then there's the whole thing about my mum and my dad anyway. You know, this is my mum cutting my hair because, you know, frankly, there's not much cash about. And of course, the barbers. Frankly, I found the guys that worked there creepy. Um, in a very masculine way. Didn't like the cut, didn't like the hair down the back of my neck afterwards either. But, um, you know, so there's two good reasons. But then there's my mum and she was a stay-at-home mum. She'd actually had a good job. She worked for, you know, one of the major banks and actually worked in their teaching centre, teaching bankers how to be bankers. And she gave that up. She chose the life of a stay-at-home mother um and that's the thing and my dad was very definitely the breadwinner liked it that way when she suggested going back to work oh, don't want to don't want to think about that i mean this was again the 1970s 1980s when one income could sustain a family um yeah so she wanted me to be her little man. Father always referred to me as boy. Um, very definitely talking about assumptions of how things should be. And again, little cl another class component aspiration. A friend of theirs told me many, many years later, oh, we always hoped to be a diplomat. You know, what? Why? How? Where? But, you know, this is how these things work. So just out of, out of this little tiny wall, all these threads leading off and, you know, just think two minutes about Barry's situation. Yeah, we're engaging in exactly the same kind of thing. You know, it's a proper, very middle class professional pursuit. And Barry won't mind me saying he likes things to be well ordered. He likes things to be just so. Um, so, of course, it's a double shock, but it's how does this life as a new father relate to my professional life where I'm just so, I am the man, and suddenly there's this other world in which my role is what? Yeah, okay, fine. But again, that relates to how we allocate gender roles, how we think about the private world of the home and the public world of our jobs, how we engage. So all of these things fade in. What about Barry's partner, his son's mother? What's their, you know, how do they arrange that relationship? And just in case we're thinking about that these relationships, you know, are just dyadic, they just have two, two people. No, all of these have, well, three people strongly, but, I'm, you know, and obviously many more because interbeing, interpenetration, interconnection. As soon as we begin to just pick at the fabric of any of these, walls and why they show up exactly where they do and exactly when they do, we find that they're the creation of an entire world. But again, we feel them. We feel them most intimately. What happens when I bump up against one of these walls? I feel anger or I feel sadness. Maybe I feel fear. What's going to happen? How will this turn out? You know, you can imagine my mother's terror at the idea of well, what if, 
what if my my boy, my precious little man turns out to be, well, what? I don't know. The unknown. Who knows? Not knowing. Always not knowing. Yeah. So that's just... This Dharma, we can kind of, as we say, enter anywhere. 80,000 Dharma doors. Any wall we find. A wall not separating us off from the world, but just a little bump in this complex web of relationship, which we always are and pull on any thread, it links to all the others. Ourselves, ourselves selfing together, our minds meeting in harmony or with a bump. The walls of our minds.